Today we're going to introduce space-time diagrams. And the goal of the video is just to get you more familiar with the space-time diagrams so you know your way around the space-time diagram. And we'd also like to relate some key features of the special theory of relativity and see how they show up in a space-time diagram. So for instance, C is the same in all inertial reference frames. How does that show up on a space-time diagram? And the Lorenz equations, how are they related to a space-time diagram? And then once you're more familiar, we're going to keep coming back to these space-time diagrams. The visual representation will make your understanding a lot more robust as we look at different phenomena in relativity. Let's begin by drawing our first ever space-time diagram. So we're going to start by doing a position time graph. But we're going to make a subtle little change because we're going to put time on the vertical axis and position on the x-axis. Now why do we do that? No real reason, but when we do typical kinematics we put time on the horizontal axis because it's the independent variable. Position depends on time. But when we do relativity, time is no longer absolute. So time is no longer the independent variable. And so there's no preference whether we put it on the horizontal or the vertical. And just to kind of remind ourselves of that, we put it on the vertical. So let's begin by drawing the path of, say, a photon of light. Now, of course, light goes really, really fast. So if we choose our scales wrong, our beam of light would just kind of run along the x-axis. We're going to choose our scale like this. For our time, we're going to go one year, two years, etc. Or it could be one second, two seconds. And for our positions, we're going to go one light year, two light years, three light years, etc. So in one year, light will travel one light year. In two years, light will travel two light years. And we're going to get a line for light like that. So this is light. Now it would have a slope of one, of course, it'd be at a 45 degree angle. Now we're used to, when things go faster, they get a steeper slope. But now, because we have position and time reversed, when things go faster, they'll have a lesser slope. So if I draw a few paths here, those could represent different objects. But be careful, because this one here is not possible. Why is that? Because it traveled two light years in one light year. In other words, it's traveling faster than the speed of light. And this one with the lesser slope, it's actually traveling faster than this one here with the higher slope. Once again, because we have the position and time axis interchanged. So thus far, with our space-time diagram, we've made some small changes from a basic position-time graph. We interchanged x and t, so time is on the vertical now. We've kind of developed new units with years and light years, or seconds and light seconds, or, or nanoseconds and light nanoseconds. And when we do that, we get that light beams will have a slope of 1. They'll be at a 45 degree angle, and no particle with mass can travel faster than the speed of light. So we can't get any trajectories that have a slope that is less than 1. And then, of course, things that are going slower will have more vertical slopes. Things that are going faster will have slopes that get closer and closer to 1. So now, let's introduce some observers to our graph. We're going to have an observer here on Earth. And he's going to measure all of his positions relative to x equal to 0 here. And so he can consider any point, any event in time. And that would have a position and a time. And we would read off the position uh, on the graph by dropping a vertical line. We'd read off the time on the graph by drawing a horizontal line. And then let's take a second observer. So our first observer here was right there at the origin, wasn't moving. 
our second observer is going to be moving relative to the first observer and when the rocket ship gets to this point here we're going to start the clock that's going to be time equal to zero and we're going to make his coordinates we're going to call those the primed coordinates so his coordinates are going to be x primed and t primed so as time advances he would move along this path here the green line and he makes all of his measurements relative to where he is in the same way that this guy makes all his measurements relative to where he is and where is he? Well he's along this green line here so this green line here is really the line x primed equal to zero he always makes his measurements from where he is now if we consider the line at x equals to zero this here is the line x equals to zero. x equal to zero is this line here which is really just the time axis so this line here x primed equal to zero that must be the t primed axis in his coordinate system so we know this green line here is the time axis for our moving observer so we've got the time axis we'd really also like to get the position axis for our moving observer and I would suggest then it's going to be about like this so this would be the x primed axis that is where t primed equals to zero and I've tried to draw it such that this angle here we'll call that theta is the same as this angle here and the reason I wanted that is because both observers have to give the same speed for light and because the path of light is exactly halfway in between the t primed axis and the x primed axis and exactly halfway between the t axis and the x-axis then if I pick out any point here on this light axis because light exactly up the middle here I should get the same ratio of x prime to t prime as I do x to t so the speed of light would be the same from both reference frames and that's our second postulate we've got to satisfy that so both frames get the same speed for light really you can just see it from the symmetry in the situation now in our original position time graph we would have a grid that would look something like so and we talk about these vertical lines as being lines of constant position or the same position and these horizontal lines would be lines of constant time and we'd like to do the same thing for our moving reference frame the primed frame so let's try to do that so let's take our rocket ship and it will move along its trajectory and just as it passes the observer on earth we're going to start our clocks but let's imagine this time that it's not a single rocket ship it's actually a squadron of rocket ships and they're placed equally along this x primed axis something like that then since they're all moving together they're all going to follow the same trajectory so they've all got to follow trajectories that are parallel to this t primed axis so these lines should all be parallel to the t primed axis so these would be what we call lines of constant position in the moving reference frame so we've got a constant position x primed but now let's allow a certain amount of time to advance so our original rocket ship 
it moves a long time this way. And we'll let it advance for a certain amount of time. So we've got a certain length here representing a time. Well, all of the rockets in the squadron advance through the same time. So we've got to get the same length here, the same time interval between the rockets because we're advancing by the same amount of time. So it's going to look something like that. And if we've drawn that correctly, then these rocket ships should lie along a line that's parallel to the x-primed axis. And we could do another line here. These would be called lines of, well, we could say at the same time, of constant time, or lines of what we call simultaneity. So they've got the same time in the moving reference frame, T prime. So whereas the grids in the non-moving reference frame are square, the grids in our moving reference frame are diamond shaped. What we'd like to do now is to establish a scale between the coordinates in the moving reference frame and the coordinates in the at rest reference frame. So what we're going to do is use a scaled grid and we're going to choose conveniently a speed for the trajectory of the moving reference frame. So let's give it a speed of 0.6c. And sometimes we just say that beta equals 0.6. And if this beta is 0.6, or we're moving at 60% the speed of light, then the gamma factor, which tells us how much our times and our lengths are contracted or dilated by, is given by 1 over the square root of 1 minus 0.6 squared. And if you work that out, you get 1.25. So now we've got a gamma factor and a speed. So let's imagine now that our non-moving reference frame, where we're referring to the coordinates as x and t, is the reference frame of some observer on Earth. And let's imagine that our moving reference frame is some observer in a rocket ship that's passing by at a speed of 0.6c. So if he's moving at 0.6 the speed of light, then let's say he goes across along the position axis by six units. One, two, three, four, five, six. So this might be six light years. Then it would take 10 light years. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten light years, and our trajectory should go through that point. So our trajectory for the rocket ship should look like so. But remember that trajectory, that's where x primed equals zero, and where x primed equals zero, that's our t primed axis. So there's our t primed axis. For our X primed axis, it's going to have to be a reflection of this line through the red line here representing the speed of light. So for our X primed axis, we should go across by 10 units 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 as we go vertically up by 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So it should go through this point. Let's draw in our x primed axis. So now let's establish a scale relationship between our time axis in the Earth reference frame and our time axis in the moving reference frame. We'll mark, make a mark here, and we're just going to say that that, is, that represents a reading of one unit of time along the t primed axis. So what that means is that this guy in the rocket ship looks at his clock and it reads a 1. Now the guy on the Earth would say, hey dude, your clock is running slow. In other words, his time is going to have to be a longer amount of time. And it's going to be longer, of course, by a factor of gamma. So t must be equal to 1.25 times 1, or just 1.25. So the time reading for this event here, the clock striking 1 in the moving reference frame, has to be gamma equals 1.25. So that really establishes a scale between the t-axis and the t-primed axis.
And we can use the same reasoning to find the relationship between the x-axis and the x-primed axis. So let's call this point right here 1. 1 unit of distance. So we can imagine our observer having a meter stick here. The far end of the meter stick would be at x primed equals to 1 meter. Now the guy on the Earth, he says your meter stick is too short. So his reading would read longer, and of course it's going to read longer by a factor of gamma. In other words, his reading for the end of that meter stick is going to be gamma times 1, or 1.25. So once again, the reading of that event in the x frame is going to be at 1.25 here, or in general, by gamma. So now we've established our scale relationship. And once we've got that scale relationship, then any point here can be read in both reference frames. And we call that point an event. So in the Earth reference frame, we would draw vertical and horizontal lines and read off the values t and x. So we'd have an x and a t for that point. In the moving reference frame, to get an x prime point, we have to go with a line parallel to the t primed axis. So it would give a value of x primed here. To get the t primed value, we've got to draw a line that's parallel to the x primed axis, which should be approximately like that and that would give you a t prime value. So you're going to have a x primed and t primed coordinates for that point, or that event, and you're going to have x and t coordinates for that same event. Now I wanted to make a point about the speed of light when we're using these special units in our graph. So here's our graph, and we said, okay, we have time on the vertical, position on the horizontal, and we might go up 1, 2, 1, 2, 3. And we could have time units of, say, minutes or years or whatever. Let's say we're using years. Then our distance unit would be light years, C years. And after one year, light would travel one light year. After two years, it would travel two light years, and you'd get this line for the trajectory of light with a slope of 1. Now the speed of light is going to have to equal distance over time. So let's say 3 C years divided by 3 years would give you 1 C. So the speed of light is equal to 1 with units of C which is to say the speed of light in units of the speed of light is simply 1. But that's kind of critical that we're ultimately getting c equal to 1 when we're using these units. Now if we take this a little farther, what you'll often see on these space-time diagrams is they'll change the variable from just t to c times t which of course is going to change the units here to c years. It's not going to change these numbers here because c is 1. Right? We're not multiplying by 3 times 10 to the 8th. In the units that we're using in this graph, c is 1. So these numbers remain the same. And this tends to be preferred because now we have the same units for our distances for space as we do for time. And that's why we're calling it space-time, because space and time are merged together. They're entangled together. They're the same sort of stuff, and therefore should have the same units. And when we use our vertical variable as c times t, then we get the same units on both axes. And, when, and, and of course, when we have the same units on both axes, c would be a unitless number simply equal to 1.
So I cut out a small portion of our last graph so that we could focus in on, let's say, this point here. And what we want to do is verify that we get the same transformation values when we use the graph as we do with the Lorentz transformations. So let's just put a little more of our scale in. If this here is 1.25, that means each one of these grids is worth 0.25. So this would be 1.75, and the same thing over here, 1.75.5.25. So now for my xt values off the graph, the x value, the x value coming down, is 0.75. And the t value moving across would be 1.25. And then from the graph, my x primed and t primed values, well, this is the t primed axis. And anywhere along that t primed axis, x primed has to be 0. So x primed is 0. And since it is along the t primed axis, we can simply read off the t prime value, and that's 1. So t prime will be 1. Let's see if we can verify those answers using the Lorentz transformation equations. So let's substitute in x primed should be equal to gamma, which is 1.25, x, 0.75, minus vt. v is equal to 0 0.6 times the speed of light. But remember, on this graph, c is equal to 1. And then we've got to multiply by the time, t was 1.25. So you get 1.25. I think you'll find 0.6 times 1.25 is 0 0.75. So we're going to get 0 0.75 minus 0 0.75 inside the brackets. So we get a value of 0. And those agree. They're the same. Let's check it out now with the t-primed equation. Gamma is 1.25. t is 1.25 as well. V is equal to 0 0.6 times C, but C is 1, so I'm going to forget it. I'm going to forget about the C squareds on the bottom because they're equal to 1. And then we've got an X here. X was 0 0.75. So we get 1.25, 1.25 minus 0.45, which is 1.25 times 0 0.8 which is exactly 1. Let's check that that's true. The graph had predicted t primed is 1, and our Lorenz equation got t primed equals to 1. So we verified the scale on our graph using the Lorenz transformation equations. In our introductory video, we said that if we had an observer on the Earth, and he could see the clock on the spaceship here, he would say, as he looked in this direction, your clock is running slow. And we've already kind of verified that with our space-time diagram. So the clock on the spaceship, that's spaceship time, let's say it's reading 1. Then the corresponding time for that event, the clock hitting 1, would be 1.25. So clearly, the Earth observer says, your clock is running slow. Now, in the introductory video, we also said that if the guy in the rocket ship can read the clock on the Earth here, he would say the same thing. He would say, your clock runs slow. So we have kind of a symmetrical situation. And the question is, does that get represented on a space-time diagram? Well, let's have the clock strike 1 o'clock. That's our event. The clock strikes 1 o'clock on Earth. Here's our time axis. That's 1.25. So 1 o'clock would be right here. Now, to find out where that occurs in the moving reference frame, we need to draw a line that's parallel to the x primed axis here. So we need a line that looks something like that. So these two lines are parallel. And where it hits there, that would be the t prime value. And since this is 1, it looks like we're about 80% of the way to here. 
And if we used a ruler and everything, we would find that it landed here at 1.25. So when this clock reads 1, the guy in the spaceship records a time of 1.25. And he can make this statement, your clock runs slow. So the fact that the two observers see each other's clocks running slow is verified on the space-time diagram. OK, let's quickly summarize the key features of the space-time diagram. We put position on the horizontal axis. We put time on the vertical axis. But we'd actually prefer our vertical variable to be c times t, where c is equal to 1 in the units that we're going to use. And the units that we're going to use for time, it would just be years, say. And then you've got to multiply by c, because that's in the variable. So we'd call that c years. And similarly for position, we would use c years for our distances. Using that system, the, tra the trajectory of light would be a line of slope 1. And our t-primed axis would be the same as the trajectory of our particle. So wherever our particle is, that's where x primed equals 0. And wherever x primed equals 0, we call that our t-primed axis. The x primed axis is just going to be a reflection in the red line for the path of light. So along this line, we've got all the points where t primed is equal to 0. And this would be what we call our x primed axis. We established a scale, and we saw that where we've got a 1 along the t-primed axis, that would give a reading of gamma along the time axis. And similarly, where we've got a 1 for our x-prime value, that would correspond to a value of gamma along the x-axis in our non-moving frame. So we can pick out any point, move vertically, and get a x value move horizontally and get a t value and so we have a point xt and we can move parallel to this x primed axis to get a t prime value and parallel to the t primed axis to get an x primed value so we'll have an x primed and t primed as the coordinates in the moving frame for that event and an x and a t for the coordinates of that same event in the non-moving frame. And then we verified that these were correct using the Lorenz equations. And that's all for today folks. Thank you very much.